I really don't want to talk about first dates, but it, it came to my mind in, in terms of um, something that's memorable, right? Uh, Tom Marge, you remember your first date? Yeah? Tom, you better shake your head. She's shaking it well. I remember most of my first bit dates, but especially I remember the first day with Nancy, and um, it was wonderful. And we went out again, and we eventually got married. That first experience that one has with Jesus, it's kind of like a first date. It's, it's, it's just really awesome. And I've, I love to hear people talk about, I've heard all kinds of stories about how when people came to faith, uh, now, that doesn't work for people like me that are lifelong uh, Christians, that they don't have a starting time, a first date that they can remember. But those people who do, they'll talk about, I was in a difficult time in my life, and all of a sudden, somebody shared with me that, that God loves me. And, and, and I cried to think that, that God would love me, and uh, then to hear that God would even die for me. I've heard people talk about, you know, I was at a point in my life when I had given up on myself. But, but then somebody said that Jesus will lift you up. And it was, it was such a great, tremendous moment. You may have your story. I would love to hear it. But that first date with Jesus is pretty awesome. But it's also pretty easy. Because Jesus just pours out his love. He just pours out his grace. And he uses his power to provide for you in ways that you have never experienced before. That's that first date with Jesus. In the Bible, we have them all over the place. We have them in here uh, in, in our gospel reading. As people brought folks that were sick uh, and, and hurting, and then they would bring them to Jesus, and uh, he would heal them. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, who's getting water, and all of a sudden Jesus talks to her. She would never forget that day. The first day with Jesus is special. It should be, shouldn't it? The Lord of all creation offers his hand to you, a nobody. And with all of his power and with all of his grace, he breathes life into you and it is forever, eternally memorable. And the joy of that is something. There are no words. Awesome doesn't even come close to describing what it is that a person when they first experience God's grace in Jesus means. We can try to imagine what it looks like, what it would feel like for somebody else. But in the first century Middle East, they actually saw it. Mr. Zander talked about how Jesus had fed the 5,000 people. That was earlier in Mark chapter 6. From one little boy's lunch. You think people ever would ever forget that day? If that was their first experience with Jesus to talk about that moment? The people that were healed by Jesus? When he crosses the sea, the word gets around so quickly that wherever he goes, there everybody's bringing their friends. Everybody's coming to listen to him teach, to preach, but they're also bringing the sick to be healed. They begged just, just to be able to touch his garment. And did you hear what Mark said? Anyone who touched his garment was healed. Everyone. That's a memorable moment. And it brought all kinds of people flooding to Jesus. The disciples had their first date with Jesus too. And they would remember that. Luke chapter 5, when they had the, the catch of fish... Uh, that was a crazy thing. The night Jesus came to Matthew's house, when he called him to be a disciple, Matthew would always remember that. 
that was memorable for them. But they had known Jesus for a while. So that first date is really awesome. It's always wonderful. But, but to live together for 63 years, that's a challenge. It's different. With Jesus, it's different. It becomes more of a challenge. I mean, the disciples were called to leave their lives and follow Jesus, not knowing where he was going to go. And I don't know if it looked like that, but that's kind of tough to give over the reins of your life to somebody else. But there's a lot more to it with the disciples, isn't there? The disciples had, to, had the privilege to experience God's grace in their own life. A huge catch of fish is something that you don't forget. Whether it's a healing or, or simply to be loved by the God that you thought hated you, whatever it might be. But the disciples now had the task of understanding Jesus so that they could proclaim Jesus. Now they had to learn of who Jesus was and, and what he wanted and how he operated. And that's not so easily done. God gives us 10 commandments. How many of you and I understand all of the Ten Commandments and how they operate. Don't raise your hand. We don't understand. And we've had them for thousands of years. And I've known them all my life. But they're beyond my understanding. That's hard. But that's not the hardest part. The hardest part is the disciples were called not to keep receiving Jesus, but to start giving Jesus. If you recall, when Jesus fed the 5,000 people, he turned to the disciples and said, hey, we've got thousands of people here, and, and they're all hungry. What should we do? How do we feed them? And the disciples said, don't. Send them home. Not necessarily because they didn't know that Jesus could feed them, They just didn't want him around. They had come off going out two by two with Jesus, and they wanted some time with Jesus just to talk about their experiences. They wanted Jesus for themselves. They didn't want to share. But Jesus said, you have to. That's what the gospel is about. That was a hard lesson for the disciples to learn, to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and to follow Jesus. They would learn it, but it would be a lifelong process of them becoming less so that Jesus might become more. I'm pretty sure they learned it as 11 out of the 12 disciples would be, cruci or would be killed because of their faith, their connection to Jesus. They got it. But it took a while. They had to share Jesus and so they had to go from receiving all the time. That's the first date, right? He takes care of me. He does this. He does this. He, oh, this is wonderful. To being those who give. And that requires that you have a heart of love. To follow Jesus requires a big heart. That can hurt. A big heart. Not just taking in, but now as one who knows Jesus, being one who gives. It was a challenge for the disciples, but it's also a challenge for you and for me. What does that mean? It is a weakness of the church today. We live in a country, we live in a culture that says, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And if I don't have enough money for what I want, I'll just use a credit card. 
keep giving me, giving me, giving me, giving me until finally somebody says, stop, you can't get any more. But we want more. We want bigger. We want better. This seeps into the church. It seeps into our hearts. We become a people who want Jesus to give to us. And within the church, when the argument is about the color of the carpet or how long the sermon is or I don't like that song, we realize that we're thinking in terms of I'm the consumer. You need to take care of me, God. That was your first date. And I look around this room. We're not on our first date anymore. God sends us out to love people, to proclaim the kingdom, to to share with those who do not know what it is to be loved by God, that they too are loved. And they will first hear that not in the words that we speak, but in the lives that we live. To reach out and to go someplace where it may be uncomfortable, maybe you don't know the language and you don't know the people and you don't know what you're supposed to do, but you go so that you might connect with people and through that connection you might share with them Jesus so that they can have their first date too so that they can experience the grace of God that they can experience the healing of God that they can experience the of God sometimes it's uncomfortable because there's not a single person in this world that God doesn't want to hear that message We don't have to go to a different country. We can walk around our own community and we can find people that are alone, that are hurt, that their lives are broken. They know that. What they don't know is whether anybody still cares about them. What they don't know is that there's a God who loves them dearly. What I do know is that God has poured out his love on you and me. And now he calls us to give and not just continue to take. He calls for us to love. When we get scared, I say, I don't know, it could be a dangerous thing. It, it could be. How valuable is that individual's life? What are you willing to risk? Jesus went to the cross for you. And there is no guarantee that you and I would even embrace his love. We might reject. We might say we don't want a second date, Jesus. For whatever reason, we might say we don't want a first date. But he spilled his blood for you and for me. And in that death, he paid your debt. And in his suffering and death, in his crucifixion, He gave himself to you and to me. We've been blessed. Now God calls us to be a blessing. Will you do that? It's a lifelong process of learning, isn't it? But let's understand it needs to be learned. Why? Because having a heart like Jesus is worth any and all suffering. One of the things that God wants to give to you isn't simply to feed you bread and fish or whatever it is that you might eat. It's not simply to heal this disease or that situation. It's not simply to pour out his grace on you and and have you experience, okay, I'm, I'm innocent. I'm not guilty anymore. I can go to heaven. One of the most precious gifts that he wants to give to you is to understand his love. Isn't that the case? Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, you heard it. In Ephesians chapter 3, he talked about this mystery of God that he wants to bring all people together, not just Jewish people, but Gentile people. Everybody in the world, he wants to bring them together, and that's the purpose of the church, to proclaim this mystery, to live this mystery. And Paul's in prison while he's writing this letter. He says, I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. 
Paul says, I'm sitting in jail for you. I want you to understand that. And I'm not upset, and I'm not sad, and I'm not mad. It's, I, I'm not crying out. It's not fair. I realize that this is a way that you can see how much I love you. And that's when he got to our epistle reading, which is his prayer. For this reason, I kneel before the Father in heaven. And in the middle of that prayer, he said this. I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, that you, having tasted of God's love, that you, having gone on that first day with God, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul said, I want you to know the depth of God's love for you, for every single person in this world. And the only way you can really know that is when you give it. And if you don't give it, you're going to be bored with church. And the problem won't be long or boring sermons or songs you don't like. The problem will be you still want God to keep giving to you, but you haven't accepted the responsibility that God has given you to be one who gives, who reaches out, who loves who shares, but it's in that sharing that our joy becomes even deeper. When you love somebody who's unlovable, that's when you realize how precious it is that God loves you. When you see somebody's life change, you realize that's what God has done for you. And that's when we have opportunity to walk arm in arm with Jesus and to rejoice and to know a joy that you can't know after the first date. You can only know after many, many years of walking together, 63 and more, not with a spouse, but with Jesus. May you and I know that joy. May the world be blessed by it. Amen.